power. And we pray God will bless his word to us this morning. And maybe I should have got David up to to say this because he'll probably do a much better impression of Baldrick than me because of where he's from in in the UK. But uh, if you ever watched Blackadder, do you remember his uh, his, uh, um, catchphrase, I have a cunning plan, right? I have a cunning plan. And it became a running joke because none of Baldrick's cunning plans were indeed cunning or what you would describe as a plan that had any chance of working. Or how about this one? Have you, have you been on, on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok and you've seen these uh, life hacks? Have you seen those, the life hacks, where it would be like someone's come up with some way to make something a little bit simpler? And, and some of them you think, oh, yeah, well, I can see how that could work. And then others of them you think, there's no way on earth that works and, uh, and, and some, some folk have caught on to this, and they've actually tested all these life hacks for us to see if they work. And it's really surprising sometimes some of the things that work. A couple of uh, weeks ago, I shared about when we were back in, in Northern Ireland visiting my parents, and we were driving back to the holiday uh, rental place that we were staying in. And as we were going up the hill, the, the car broke down, and we ended up having to leave the car there and borrow my mum's car and have it for a couple of weeks. But when I finally went back to get it, I was driving back towards the boat and the engine starts to overheat. I think, for goodness sake, it's just been to the mechanic. What is going on here? So I pull over and um, I have a look under the bonnet, even though I have no idea about anything to do with cars. I thought, I'll look under the bonnet anyway. And uh, I I mean, I knew where some things are. I knew where the coolant went in, and I could see that it was running low. So I topped it up, um, and the same problem. The car was running too hot. So I phoned Claire, mainly uh, to vent. (laughs) Um, But then I also remembered that our neighbor's a mechanic, so I thought, I wonder if he's in. So... He was in, and he, and he said immediately, he's like, I know exactly what's happened. And uh, to cut a long story short, when, when they'd replaced the clutch, they hadn't bled the radiator properly. And so it's a bit like in your house when there's an air bubble. It wasn't working. It wasn't cooling anything down um, because there was this air bubble in. And he gave me this piece of advice, and I thought, there's no way on earth that's going to work. He said, turn your engine on and put the heating up full blast and as hot as you can possibly get it. I was like, surely the last thing my car needs is heat, but lo and behold, it worked. And the engine cooled down and it also got rid of the, uh, the airlock in the system. And uh, I drove back, although I was a bit paranoid, I drove back with the windows down and the, and the heating on full blast because I was scared it was going to overheat again, but it didn't. Why did I, I share all that? Well, today our passage is all about wisdom. It's all about wisdom. And verse 18 is a bit of a summary of everything that's going on. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So for those who are perishing, the cross is a bit like one of Baldrick's cunning plans. But it's much more like my car for us, the advice I got about turning the heating on. It may look like defeat, it may look even foolish, but it's the power of God for salvation. Verse, tw- verse 19 is, is, a, is a quote, and uh, Paul's quoting uh, Isaiah 29. And in Isaiah 29, what's going on is that uh, there is there's a lot of hypocrisy going on in uh, amongst Judah, and they're They're doing things and they're saying things, but their heart is not in it. And and there there are leaders at the time who are kind of backing that sort of 
hypocrisy and kind of meaningless worship that's going on. And this is what he says to him. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. So Paul then takes this idea and he applies it to what's going on in Corinth. And the first thing that he does is he sets up the wisdom of God against the wisdom of the world. Verse 20, where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Paul's goading the same group of people, wise men in Corinth. And actually, it's interesting, the words that he uses here, he's not attacking just the Greeks or just the Jews. He's attacking the Greeks and the Jews who uh, consider themselves wise in the eyes of the world by using philosopher, by using teacher of the law. He's, he's kind of tackling both, uh, both sides of the church, if you like. And verse 20 and 21 kind of get us to the heart of the issue. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. Here's the problem. The problem is that the wisdom of the world can't do something. It can't get us to God. We can't know God through the wisdom of of the world. We need God's wisdom for that. And his wisdom is what is being preached, the foolishness of what is being preached to uh, the Corinthians, namely the cross, which is then links back to verse 18. But what are these uh, wisdoms? Why, why won't they get us to God. We get some insight into them in verse 22 and following. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. So in Jewish wisdom regarding the Messiah, the the importance is upon, upon signs, signs and wonders. They expect the Messiah to do amazing things. And the reason why the cross is a stumbling block for them is they think that it's the ultimate sign that Jesus isn't who he said he was. He isn't the Messiah because it looks like defeat. Whereas the Greeks have a problem with the the, the, the Jesus story and the cross because they, they can't comprehend the idea of a criminal being the savior of the world or being a God. They can't comprehend the idea of a God suffering at all. And therefore for them, it's, well, it's just foolish. It's silly. But Paul says, to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. In other words, regardless of your nationality, regardless of how you think and in terms of, of what knowledge and wisdom should look like, the cross for those who understand that and grasp it by the Holy Spirit, it's the wisdom of God. It is the wisest thing. And Paul points, Paul's point rather, why is he saying this? What's this got to do with this overall theme of unity and disunity? His point is this, well, why, why try to deepen your faith by abandoning the way in which you came to faith, to looking to the world instead of to looking uh, to Christ? And the outworking of that is when you, when you look to the world, as we saw last week, you divide into factions to those who you think are wise. And so there is disunity. His point is, why do you go to anyone else other than Christ to deepen your faith? If he is the wisdom that brought you to faith in the first place. 
The next bit of the passage, he, he zeroes in on the Corinthians themselves. And he says in verse 26 that none of them were wise, powerful, and rich. And he's not slagging them off here. He's, he's saying that's a good thing. In verse 27, he says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. And this is all this we talk about, when we talk about faith, we talk about the upside down kingdom. And Jesus on the cross is the ultimate example of that. How does, how does he conquer sin, death, and the evil one? He does it through what looks like defeat on the cross. And then those who follow after him, we are told that the first will be last and the last will be first. This upside down sort of thing. So it shouldn't surprise us that the wise, are the, sorry, the, the less wise, the not powerful and the poor are the ones that God uses. And we see why in verse 28. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. What's, what's the overall, the overarching point for Paul here? It's this. Only, only God and Jesus Christ can get us to God. We are completely dependent upon him <laughs> for salvation. We are not self-sufficient and, and nothing changes in that respect when we come to faith. We remain dependent on him for life. We remain dependent on him to to, to use, um, use the gifts that he has given for his sake in the world. In fact, these things, wisdom, power, wealth, can be major stumbling blocks to the deepening of our faith or to coming to faith in the first place. And Paul's point is this, why pursue these things? Why want these things in our life? they're going to be a distraction from knowing God and knowing him more. And then the last thing, the last bit, is that then Paul points to himself as an example of someone who is completely dependent on God. Did you notice when we were reading? And so it was, this is verse 1 of chapter 2, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So Paul's speech, Paul's demeanor, they do not look great in the eyes of the Corinthian world. And Paul says, but that's for your benefit because it means that it's not Paul who brought you to faith by great rhetoric. It's God by his Holy Spirit who brought you to faith. And again, Paul's point is, you've seen how God has used someone like me so powerfully amongst you. Why look to anyone other than him to deepen your faith? So that's what's going on in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 2, 5. But what does it mean for us? How does it apply to our lives today? Well, there's six things that I want to point out to you. The first one is this. Paul is making an exclusive claim here about Jesus. He's saying Jesus is God's wise plan for how we can come to know him. There is no other way for us to know him. Human wisdom can't get us there. We can't think our way to God. There's no room for 
at that kind of popular belief today that, that something is, that, that Jesus is okay for you, but he's not for me. Jesus is either the way, the truth, and the life, or he's not. And all of us need to make a decision regarding that. All of us need to, to seriously consider, because if Jesus is who he says he is, then it's life-changing. If Jesus isn't who he says he is, then those of us who believe in him, Paul says, are to be pitied above all men. So we need to all make a decision about this, look into it seriously and consider it. And the amazing thing about God, the amazing thing about Jesus is he says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. So I encourage you, if that's where you're at, to look into it. Then the second thing I want to point out is that Paul is not an anti-intellectual, as has sometimes been suggested in the history of the church. What, what Paul is against here is anti, he's anti-Christless intellectualism. There's a way of pursuing learning, pursuing uh, academia, that is Christ-centered and there is a way that is not. Well, how do we tell the difference? Well, we look to the motives. Why am I doing what am I, I'm doing? Am I doing it because I, I care about how I look? Am I doing it or am I doing it because I care about how Christ looks? Am I doing it because of, of how it would help me and advance me and make me rich or make me powerful or make me wise? Or am I doing it because I want to serve Christ with all that I have and what he has given me? So Paul's not anti-intellectual. He's just anti-Christless intellectualism. And the third thing is to say that wealth, knowledge, and power are dangerous things. We need to guard our hearts about the negative influence that they can have on our lives. Guard our hearts against the distraction that they can be uh, to us. And guard our hearts really against self, the self-sufficiency that, that, that they promote. So you, you can see it, can't you? If you're, if you're wealthy, if you can buy anything that you want to buy, if you can live comfortably in this world, it's very easy to say, I can do this on my own. Or if you're powerful, if you can make decisions that impact your life and make your life better, you can easily see how you can say, oh, well, I'm doing all right here. I can do this on my own. Or if you're very wise, if you've got lots of knowledge, you can easily see how you can think, I don't need any help. I know how to do this. So we need to guard our hearts against self-sufficiency. And then following on, on from that, we need to realize our own inadequacy. And not to make ourselves feel bad, but to embrace it. That's what Paul does in the passage. He embraces his own inadequacy. In fact, later on in, in, in 2 Corinthians, he says, he says he boasts in his weakness because when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because when we are weak, when we step out of our comfort zones, when we do to do what God calls us to do, we depend on him. And who knows if you do that today or this week, you could be a demonstration of the Spirit's power to someone that you come in contact with. Then fifth thing to, to point out is, who is our example? Who do we look to as an example of how to follow Jesus? Do we look to those who have um, great gifts? Do we look to their, the magnitude of their gifts? Or do we look to the motive behind the use 
of those gifts? Do we look to those who are faithful or do we look to those who are flashy? Do we look to those whose character is godly or those who are charismatic? And the last thing, one of the interesting uh, points as you look through history is that the great moves of God throughout history have tended to start with the people that Paul talks about in this passage, the poor, the powerless, the ones who are not wise in the eyes of the world. I wonder who are those people today in our culture? One of the things that's really interesting about the church in the United Kingdom particularly, but the church in the West, generally speaking, we talk about, often talk about a, a missing generation in the church, the sort of uh, the 18 to 30-year-old um, but often there's a missing class within the church as well. I was reading uh, a book a while ago called Chav Christianity, which is a great title. Um, and, and in it, the, the, the guy who was writing the book said that when he became a Christian, he grew up on a housing estate. Who was that? Well done, James, you can go first. Um, so this guy, he grew up in a housing estate. He didn't have any money growing up. His, uh, I think his parents were both on, on, uh, on benefits. He became a Christian. And he looked around his housing estate for someone to be an example to him of how do I be a Christian on a housing estate? And he couldn't find anybody. He had no example to follow, and that really resonated with me. That's a huge problem, and a problem that we must rectify in the church. So some questions then for us to take away. Firstly, as I said, Paul makes this exclusive claim, and I just invite you to consider, do you know Jesus? And if you'd like to, encourage you to look into it. If you want some help looking into it, chat to me, chat to Kaz after the service. We'd love to help you do that. Secondly, we need to examine our own hearts and, and ask ourselves, why do I seek wisdom and knowledge? What are my motives for learning? Thirdly, we need to look at our lives, examine our hearts, and ask the question, am I attempting self-sufficiency in any area of my life? Is there an area of my life, in other words, that I need to come to God and say, Lord, I need you to help me? Then fourthly, who, who do you look to as an example? What is it about them? consider whether it's those things. Is it the magnitude of gift, the mood of the gift? Is it because they're faithful or flashy? Is it because of their character or their charisma? And then finally, how am I? How could I connect with the poor and the marginalized in my city? How can we do our little bit to help um, rectify that problem of a missing class from our church. Let me just give you a couple of minutes. Hopefully one of those questions has resonated with you. Just give you a chance to, to talk to God about them before um, I pray and we move into a time of communion.
For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your incredible plan. your astonishing plan, Lord, that you would even create human beings in the first place. Never mind that you would leave the glory and the wonder of heaven and descend not just to, to live amongst us and above us, but to live as one of us, to experience what it truly means to be human, to experience the impact and the effects of the fall and yet remain sinless. We praise you this morning. We praise you that what the world says is foolishness of God is, is par for our salvation. And we pray, Lord, that you will draw us deeper into our relationships with you, that you would help us look to Christ, spend time with him. Help us, Lord, to resist the temptation it is to, to live self-sufficiently or attempt to, to try to do things in our own strength. Help us to be like Paul. Help us to be those who rely on you and not our own strength. And I pray, Lord, that you would expose those areas of our lives where we are proud, where we are, are kind of clinging on to control of them and help us to lay them at your feet and ask for your help. Humble us, we pray. Humble us so that we can draw closer to you. Humble us so that we can be a demonstration of the Spirit's power to those that we come into contact with this week. Continue to speak to us, we pray, as we move into this time of communion. Amen. Let's, uh, let's pass uh, the 